Well, it's coming. We are nearing the end of the semester, and boy, is it coming fast. Close to April, I'm certain that many of you are looking at your syllabi, looking at the tests and papers that you have coming up, and starting to prepare. Or maybe if you're like me, it means that you're at least starting to have anxiety if you're not preparing. Well, back when I was in college, I took many tests, and being a science major, many of those tests had right or wrong answers, and I had to pick from a bank of multiple choices. Now, I also had a serious case of test anxiety. I wonder if any of you have ever experienced this, test anxiety. Test anxiety is a crazy bird. You see, I was pretty good at science. I always loved it, and I excelled at it. I always knew the answers except when it came to tests. I studied, I learned, I came prepared, and then faced with four choices, more often than not on any given test, there was a few questions that I got stuck. My test anxiety would kick in, my gut would tell me one answer, and then I'd overthink it. And then I'd change my answer and get it wrong. Rats! If I'd only gone with my first instinct. What is it about overthinking that gets us into trouble? It's like that scene in a horror movie when everyone knows there's something in the closet. And everyone in the room is just begging the protagonist to stay away. You're going to get eaten. You even think that maybe they know too, but then their rational mind kicks in and they say, surely there's nothing in the closet. And so they approach, and the music gets scarier, and we creep to the edge of our seats, and the door slowly opens, and bam! Freddy comes out of the closet, and well, see you later, Joe. We liked you, but why didn't you listen to your gut and run away while you could? I wonder if this is what happens to us in our faith sometimes. Why is it that we always default to our heads and forget to listen to our hearts? In today's Old Testament reading, we hear a little bit about the heart. So let's listen to the words again from Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. We know the Lord. It's written on our hearts. But what does this mean, anyway? Well, we also hear that God is making a new covenant with us. And to understand this, we have to go back to Noah, to Abraham, to Moses. God first covenants with Noah that he will no longer flood the earth because of humankind's iniquities. So through the waters of the flood, we are promised life. And then there's Abraham. God covenants with Abraham to grant him many descendants, more than the sand on the shore, more than the stars in the sky, and land for God's people. Next, God covenants with Moses. This time, it's a covenant that establishes community. Not only are there descendants in the promise of land, but God gives the people the law to set them apart, to create community that is distinctly God's own. God creates a way for the people, the Israelites, to acknowledge God through the law. And the Ten Commandments set up an understanding for us how to be in relationship with God and with each other. But, as we read in Scripture time and time again, we fall short. The Israelites couldn't keep the commandments. It was too tough to trust. We're hungry, they cried. We're thirsty. There is no water, and we don't like your food. 
to which we learned a few weeks ago, God sends snakes to bite the people for this complaint, so then they're not happy with the snakes either. Where are we going? Can't we just go back to Egypt? Surely it was better there. And on and on, time and time again, they lose their faith. And this brings us to the reading in today in Jeremiah. Once again, the people have lost faith. They don't know how to trust. And maybe for good reason, at this point, they're in exile. They had lost their kingly succession as promised by God. Their temple, which was the center of worship life and all they knew to be holy, had been destroyed. And their belief that Jerusalem itself was invincible, well, that was utterly turned upside down. So as they questioned whether God was faithful and powerful as they first thought and as God promised, these words from Jeremiah bring a renewed sense of hope and relationship. God hasn't left. Israelites, trust your heart. You know the Lord. The Lord has been faithful in the flood, in the desert, and now God will be faithful to you even in ex exile. It's so funny to me that I often catch myself looking at these passages and shaking my heads at the Israelites. I could almost echo the words of Jesus that we hear time and time again, you of little faith. Why can't you just have faith, Israelites? Don't you see? But it's easy to see in hindsight, isn't it? In our own lives, aren't there times when we just don't know if we'll make it through? The anxiety level is high, there's so much to do, so much to worry about, or worse yet, there is crisis. The end just doesn't seem to be in sight. How will I pass this test? Will I graduate? Will I find a job? Or worse, what do I do about this addiction? My heart is breaking. Will it ever heal? I'm lonely. I'm scared. So what then? Do we throw out all we know in our heads? Do we completely ignore what we understand rationally in our lives? Is there no purpose for the law and the rules that sometimes get broken? Absolutely not. It's kind of like the question, which came first, the chicken or the egg? One of those mysterious questions in life. But our question is, head or heart? I often wonder about the brain and the heart. Which is more important? Without the heart beating, the brain doesn't get oxygen. It doesn't function, and it ceases to, and it shuts down. But without the brain, the heart doesn't know how to beat in the first place. The two are intricately intertwined to work together, needing each other to function properly. We need to know in our heads, we need to think through things, and we need to use the skills that we have been given, but we also need to remember the heart. Without the heart, the other just isn't enough. You see, the heart is where we trust. You have to trust your teammates. You have to trust relationship. For Falco, he trusts the other guys on the field, and they trust him. And he doesn't just know skills and his playbook. He knows the guys and what they can do together on the field. And he also knows that even when the rules get jumbled and the plays get broken or the temple is destroyed, there is still a way. That trusting in each other, you can rebuild. We also have to trust our instincts. And this is kind of like another one of my favorite movies, Star Wars. As Luke gets ready to defeat the, the uh, Death Star. He sets up his X-Wing, right? And he gets into the tunnel. He turns to his training and skills. He's an excellent pilot. He has all the skills. He has the technology he needs. So as he's going through the tunnel, he pulls the computer screen up and he begins to focus on his target. And then the voice comes, use the force, Luke. So he puts away the video screen and he trusts what's deep inside. Heart is where you find the extra something, where you learn to look beyond the law at what the law is really for, where you look beyond what you know and look at why you know it. Martin Luther teaches us that the law has two purposes, and one of those purposes is to know when we've done wrong. 
But the other purpose is to know why it is that we need a savior. Why we need to be in relationship with God in the first place. The law points us to Christ and moves us into relationship with him. In our head, we know the law. We know what we're supposed to do. We know cognitively that God promises to be faithful. And we know that in our heads. We have to know that in our heads. But heart means we have to believe. And so God writes the law on our hearts. God establishes a new covenant in Christ that is based on how we, not on how we live the law, but how we are in relationship with God. How we trust in a God who has sent us a son to be in relationship with us, even to the point of dying for us. And in dying, as we hear in the gospel today, Jesus draws us to himself. This is not an image of acquaintance. This is an image of a parent who pulls us in to comfort, to love, and to forgive. This is someone we know. We know the Lord. Let us trust in the promise in the new covenant and let us believe with our hearts. Amen.